guys welcome to my channel this video is going to be about somebody that actually wasn't as well known as he probably should have been because as many victims as he had and how brutal his murders were you would think he would be more heard about than like for instance you have Ted Bundy I mean everybody knows Ted Bundy everybody knows Charles Manson but does everybody know Paul John Knowles? Have you guys heard of Paul John Knowles? I didn't think so. <laughs> well, maybe some of you guys have, but most people probably haven't. And he was given the name the Casanova Killer because he was very good looking. He was, he was a redhead. He was very good looking. He was very charming. But he committed all of his murders in a four month span. So you have Ted Bundy who his span four years. Paul Knowles was four months and his body count was, he claimed that he killed 35 people, but they were only able to confirm 18 of them, but still 18, possibly 35 in four months. That was about the amount that Ted Bundy did in four years. Just makes you wonder. I have some theories on maybe why he wasn't as well known as uh, some of the other ones, but I'll get into that uh, later on in the video. So let's get into this. Born Paul John Knowles, April 17th, 1946 in Orlando, Florida. His father gave him up at a young age to live in foster homes and reformatories. Paul demonstrated psychological problems since the beginning. With his early on incarcerations and coming from an unstable environment, he showed early signs of anger and resentment towards others. Rejection would later on trigger him to become a ruthless killer. Even from a young age, Paul disliked authority figures. He didn't trust them. He felt he didn't need anything from them. Growing up, he habitually refused to do his homework. He talked back to adults, he stole, and he even punched a girl in the face when she rejected him. So he didn't take rejection very good at all. Whenever his parents or teachers reprimanded him, Paul would lash out in this terrible rage against them. His rebellion against authorities actually won him over with his friends. His friends kind of looked up to him and he kind of got, you know, extra attention from his friends because he was this rebellious child, you know. People were kind of looking up to him, they were encouraging him. It kind of encouraged this behavior from the beginning. He idolized criminals who traveled across the country committing crimes, lost their lives in violent shootouts with police, and achieved a level of fame. So these were the people he was idolizing. Throughout his childhood, Paul was in and out of the Florida School for Boys, which is a reform school with a terrible history of abusing, torturing, and even murdering his young inmates.
this is where he was in and out of, so they think that he probably was abused. We don't know if or how badly Paul was abused, but it's likely this place had a very negative impact on him. It's unclear how Knowles identified sexually, but gender was not a disqualifying factor for his victims. He raped and murdered women and teenage girls, strangling them with their own nylon stockings, and the gay men that he killed were found in the nude. Paul took thrill and pleasure from degrading his victims. changing his M.O., thus grew bolder and more deranged the more he killed without getting caught. He even killed an on-duty cop. And had sex with a corpse of one of his later victims. However, he never killed young boys, even if they witnessed one of his crimes, because they likely reminded him of himself from his reform school days. He also didn't kill writers because he wanted them to write about him when he died. To ensure his place in history, he kept a log recording of the details of his murders. Paul turned those tape recordings of his confession over to his lawyer, Sheldon Yavitz, instructing him to release it after he died. He wanted a book written, he wanted a movie done, and he wanted the proceeds to be split with his mother. So those tapes were handed over to the courts, but then they got destroyed in a fire and a flood. So those tapes are lost, which is very unfortunate because how awesome would that be to be able to listen to those? I mean, even for profiling and for the FBI and to understand the mind of a serial killer to have all of his murders documented. And I'm sure there's, there's hints to, you know, why and his mood and just, I mean, you could tell a lot from a, a voice recording. So for each one he's recording, all the details of how and when. So in that moment of time, you could hear his emotion, you could hear his thoughts, you could hear just a lot you could tell by that. And now they're all lost. But Paul also left behind letters, notes, and drawings to his attorney, his parents, and the women he loved. So we have those. And then there's also another set of tapes where Paul is talking to his psychiatrist. So I figured I will do a part two and I'll read you the letters and play you some of those recordings. So that'll be part two of the Casanova Killer. So if you guys are interested in that, that'll be coming up soon. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna rewind back to Paul age 19, right? He landed in prison for the first time for kidnapping a police officer. So 19 years old, he's in prison, first time in prison, but he's been in and out of detention homes and just getting in trouble. He stole his first bike when he was seven years old. He was always just like a petty thief, stealing and just misbehaving. But the, his first time in prison was when he was 19. And yeah, he kidnapped a police officer, but after that he was in and out of jail the rest of his life for various convictions of burglary and auto theft. So in early 1974, while Paul was serving time in Rayford Prison in Florida, now known as Florida State Prison, he began responding to these letters from a divorcee in San Francisco named Angela Kovic, who would make trips to visit Paul in Florida. So Paul ended up proposing to Angela and she accepted. And Angela actually helped with Paul's attorney's fees. So, she, so he was able to get out early. So he got released from prison earlier than when he was supposed to because she helped him hire a lawyer and paid for the lawyer. And so he got out early and they had made plans when he gets out that he was gonna move to California and they were gonna get married. So Paul flew directly to San Francisco after he got released from prison and she broke off the engagement because of a psychic she went to who foresaw an entry of a new dangerous man in her life. So she took that serious and she broke it off. She's thinking, okay, this is the new dangerous man. I'm not taking any chances. And I bet she looked back after he ended up getting in trouble for murder and was probably like, wow, I was so glad I listened to that psychic. I mean, can you imagine? You, you go to a psychic, they tell you that, and you're probably debating, should I listen to her? Should I not? What do I do? You know, I love this guy. And then you listen to her, you break it off. But I'm sure she had thoughts of regret. And she probably had thoughts like, man, did I do the right thing? What if the psychic was crazy? What if it wasn't true? But then she finds out he murders all these people. She was probably like, oh my gosh, thank you. I bet you she went back to that psychic again. 
So the night that she dumped him, Paul claimed that he killed three people that night, but they can't confirm that. That has never been confirmed, so whether he did or didn't, who knows, but he claimed that he killed three people that night. And he blamed Angela's rejection for his escalation to rape and murder. He blamed her for that. So Paul returned to Jacksonville, Florida. He was soon arrested after pulling a knife on a bartender during a fight. But he picked the lock in his detention cell and escaped July 26, 1974. So he got arrested, picks the lock, escapes. Over the next few months, Paul traveled from Florida up the East Coast to Connecticut, leaving a trail of bodies in his wake. Later dubbed the Casanova murders for Paul's good looks and charm. But the police remained largely in the dark about Paul's part in the murders until his capture. For most of the spree, the police were baffled by the murders, as they seemed to have no rhyme or reason behind them. It appeared that there was no pattern between any of the cases or any of the victims. Usually, um, serial killers would have a certain MO that he didn't have one. He changed it. So the police just, they weren't even sure if this was the same person doing this because everything was so different from one murder to the next. So Paul's cross-country murder spree began in Jacksonville on the night of his escape. He broke into the home of a 65-year-old woman named Alice Curtis, bound and gagged her, ransacked her home for money and valuables, then he stole her car. And Alice actually choked to death on her gag. So this was his first confirmed victim. On the street where he intended to abandon the car, Paul recognized family acquaintances Lillian and Milette Anderson. Lillian was 11 years old and her sister Milette was only seven years old. And in fear that they would identify him, he kidnapped them both, strangled them, and buried their bodies in a nearby swamp. The next day in Atlantic Beach, Florida, Paul broke into the home of Marjorie Howe. strangling her with a nylon stocking and stealing her TV set. His next victim was a teenager, Jane Doe. She was a hitchhiker. He raped and strangled her for sport as he drifted aimlessly working his way north. On August 23rd, he invaded the home of Kathy Pierce, strangling her with a telephone cord while her three-year-old son watched, but he left the child unharmed. Can you imagine what that child saw? Like three years old, so their memory possibly, they say your memory starts to develop when you're three years old, so possibly he remembers some of that now as he got older that he would remember some of that. Let's hope he doesn't remember that instance. It's probably so too traumatic that he probably repressed it down if he did form a memory on it. But at three years old, possibly he might not have a memory of it. Let's hope. But like he said, he never killed little boys because they think that it reminds him too much of himself when he was a little boy. And he, I mean, I, from hearing his history, I'm thinking maybe he was abused. They said he went to that reformatory school, Florida for Boys. Florida School for Boys, which is known for abusing, torturing, and actually even killing some of the boys. So I think that he was, he experienced something in there that set him off, in my opinion. Because he was a brutal murderer. I mean, listen to some of this. He said 35 people, so 18 confirmed, but I mean, as I go through, you'll see how brutal these murders are. Something just was not right, and I just wonder if it's, I think it's biological and environmental, and if he experienced some stuff in that, that Florida school for boys, that reformatory that was known for that, and maybe he, he um, experienced some very traumatizing stuff too. So he kind of had a, a empathy for little boys, because it probably reminded him, oh, when he, you know, how he felt so scared and 
afraid when he was a little boy and he probably kind of projected that onto the other little boys so he didn't want to hurt them. So on September 3rd, 1974, Paul entered Scott's Inn. It was a roadside pub near Lima, Ohio, and he met William Bates. A 32-year-old account executive for Ohio Power Company. The bartender that knew Bates recalled that Bates and a young red-headed man had a few drinks and then they left together. And then Bates' wife reported Bates missing. And then the police realized Bates' car was missing too. And near the bar, the police found an abandoned car that was traced back to Alice Curtis, which remember Alice Curtis was his first confirmed victim that he killed and he stole her car, remember that? So what he did is he took Bates' car now left Alice's car at the bar, and now Bates is missing. So in October, Bates' nude body was found. He had been strangled and dumped in the woods. Now driving Bates' car, he moved to a campground in Eli, Nevada, where on September 18th, 1974, he bound and shot two elderly campers, Emmett and Lois Johnson. Because it was seemingly a random murder, there were no leads until Paul later confessed to the crime. Although he did use their credit cards for a short period of time to pay for some expenses. Three days later, passing through Sequin, Texas, he spotted a female motorist stranded at roadside, so he stopped to help her. Well, pretend to help her. I mean, obviously, we know his intentions are good from his history, but supposedly he stopped acting like he was going to help her, raped her before he strangled her, and, and dragged her body through a tangled barbed wire fence. This guy is brutal. And why don't we hear about him more? We're hearing about, I mean, we hear about all these other famous serial killers and this guy was brutal and he did all this in four months. Just wait, there's more. And it's like, why, why doesn't nobody really hear about this guy? Nobody hears about the Casanova killer or Paul Knowles. He's, it's just very rare that you would hear about him. So on September 23rd, he met a beautician and Dawson in Birmingham. And instantly, he caught her attention. I mean, instantly she was attracted to him. So they traveled together and she paid for all the expenses until Paul grew tired of the game and he killed her on September 29th. So he let her live, what, six days? She traveled with him, paid for everything, and then he grew tired of it and he kills her. But her body was never found. But Knowles claims to have dumped her body into the Mississippi River but it was never recovered. Paul drifted on through Oklahoma, Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota, apparently keeping his nose clean, leaving no bodies behind. So when he passed through those states, he didn't kill anybody. But by the time he got to Marlboro, Connecticut, October 16th, he continued his vicious killing spree. He entered the home of Karen Wine and her 16-year-old daughter, Dawn, on October 16th, where he bound and raped them before killing them with a nylon stocking. The only thing found missing from their home was a tape recorder. And then Knowles had made his way to Woodford, Virginia, barging into a home of a 53-year-old woman, Doris Hovey. Shooting her to death with her own husband's rifle and wiping it clean of his fingerprints and placing it beside her body. Afterward, police would find no signs of sex or robbery to offer them a motive in the case. So Paul still driving Bates' stolen car Paul picked up two hitchhikers in Key West. He was planning on killing both of them, but his plan kind of got ruined when a policeman stopped him for a traffic violation. And the officer let him go with a warning. But the experience had shaken Paul up. So he decided to drop off his passengers off in Miami. So he decided not to kill them. He was just all shaken up. So he dropped them off in Miami and he called his lawyer. His lawyer suggested that he surrender, but Paul didn't want to surrender but he met his attorney long enough to hand over those taped confessions that I was talking about. The ones where he, he just, he wanted to be famous. So he purposely recorded his killings and all the details, hoping after he died that 
it would make him famous. They'd be able to make a movie or write a book about him. So anyway, he handed those over to his lawyer and then slipped out of town before police were even informed of his presence. Paul was suspected in the November 2nd murder of hitchhiker Edward Hilliard, found in some nearby woods, and his companion Debbie Griffin, whose body has never been recovered. On November 6th in Milledgeville, Georgia, Paul befriended Carswell Carr and was invited back to Carr's house to spend the night. So they had a few drinks and he stabbed Carr to death and then strangled Carr's 15-year-old daughter. And after murdering the daughter, Paul attempted to engage in sex with her corpse. Paul's victims were killed in at least six different states, making it impossible for the police to create a perimeter. At that point, the police didn't know if they were looking for a rapist, a murderer, an armed gunman, an opportunist, or worse, all of the above. The only real lead that the authorities had to go on was from a reporter named Sandy Fox. About two weeks before Paul was arrested, he attempted to pick Fox up in a hotel bar. For three days, Sandy traveled around with Paul, unaware that she was fraternizing with a man at the center of a multi-state manhunt. Paul told Sandy that his name was Daryl Golden. Sandy described him as a lanky, ruggedly handsome redhead, like a dreamboat, she said. It was Sandy who first described Paul as Robert Redford-like in appearance years later, after realizing how close she had come to becoming one of his victims. Can you imagine hearing about this years later, after it all comes out and you realize that the man you were traveling with for three days killed possibly 35 people right at the same time when you were traveling with him, like right in the middle, you were basically with him for three days right in the middle of his murder spree. And the only reason he didn't kill her is because she was a writer and he wanted his story to be told afterwards. So what better way is keep the writer alive so after he dies, she could write about him. She did, she ended up writing a book actually about her three days with him. She said not once during those three days did he seem like he ever wanted to hurt her. She didn't feel scared or like that he wanted to hurt her at all. Probably because he had no plans on hurting her. He knew, he probably found out right away she was a writer and he knew he wanted to keep her alive so she could tell the story. They even say that most people believe the reason Paul let Sandy go was he wanted the fame. And a theory corroborated by the survival of Barbara Tucker another writer who escaped his wrath. Perhaps he felt that writers would immortalize him and that if they told his story, he could go out in a blaze of glory. So anyway, Sandy and Paul separated on November 10th, but Paul picked up one of Sandy's friends, Susan McKenzie, the next day. So after he separated from Sandy, he picks up one of her friends the next day, demanding sex at gunpoint. And thank God she escaped and notified the police. But when the patrolman tried to stop him, Paul brandished a sawed-off shotgun and made his escape. So then he travels up to West Palm Beach. He invaded the home of an invalid Beverly Maybe, abducting her sister, Barbara Maybe Abel, and stealing their car. And he dropped his hostage off in Fort Pierce, Florida the following night. But actually, she kind of tells the story of what happened, how she escaped. When he tied me up, he always made it real loose. And then the last time, he didn't know that he left the keys on the nightstand. He didn't know that he did that. He just locked the door and went his way. And so I started sawing my sheet thing off and I got myself loose. If I was a copywriter, I know that's what saved my life. And I was telling him, like, why do you want to write a book? And he wanted to be famous. Famous for what? Murdering a person? I fell in love with him for maybe an on November 17th, a Florida Highway Patrol trooper named Charles Eugene Campbell recognized a car matching the description of one stolen from the most recent murder victim. He pulled the car over, never knowing 
he had just cornered a cunning and skilled mass murderer. Paul John Knowles, however, was ready. As the trooper leaned over to see into the car, Paul wrestled the gun away from him. After taking Campbell hostage, he took off in Campbell's patrol car and pulled over another car. Then he took that driver prisoner. This is James Meyer, the motorist that Paul Knowles pulled over in the patrol car. put him and Campbell in a less conspicuous vehicle and drove the three of them to a remote area. He then led the two men in the woods, tied them to a tree, and shot them. As he attempted to escape the scene of the crime, he lost control of the vehicle and hit a tree. So he took off on foot and was pursued by dogs, officers, and helicopters. He ultimately made it out of the perimeter established for the man. However, thanks to a local man and a shotgun, Paul was able to be apprehended. Once arrested, he confessed to 35 murders, including the 20 that the police were already aware of. Over the next month, the police attempted to take Paul on a tour of his crime scenes to help gain insight into the crimes and help find missing bodies. On December 18, 1974, just a month after his arrest, Sheriff Earl Lee and Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent Ronnie Angel were transporting Paul to Henry County where Charles Campbell's handgun had allegedly been dumped by Paul while en route Paul attempted to wrestle Lee's firearm away, just as he had done with Charles Eugene Campbell. The gun went off through the holster in the car, and as Lee and Paul struggled, Agent Ronnie Angel fired three shots at Paul, killing him instantly. And so the violent life of Paul John Knowles ended as viciously as he'd lived it. The motive behind his murders have never been disclosed. Today, some of the victims remain a mystery as well. Of the 20 people found dead, 14 were women, 6 were men, 3 were children, and 3 were elderly. Some were shot, some were strangled, some were robbed, and others seemed to have been killed as an afterthought. Murdered while camping or walking up a street, some of the corpses had been sexually assaulted, while some of the victims had been raped while alive, further throwing the police off the trail. At the time of his death, he was only 28 years old. 18 murders had been tied to the Casanova killer, although he claimed to have murdered as many as 35 people. He still remains one of the lesser known serial killers of his generation, despite having murdered his victims in the most unspeakable ways. Why isn't he as well known as some of the other serial killers of his generation? The guy killed men, women, and children, as well as a cop over the span of four months. He was arguably better looking than Ted Bundy, but I guess that's all up to opinion. I mean, everybody has different opinions on who's good looking, but a lot of people would say he was actually even better looking than Ted Bundy. Let me know in the comments, who do you think is better looking, Ted Bundy or Paul Knowles?
serious. And he might have killed just as many people as Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy's span lasted four years of killing people. So he'd had four years to kill that many people. Paul Knowles had four months and killed just about as many people as Ted Bundy did in four years. The man's life was absolutely crazy, and yet he is still pretty obscure. He is very rarely talked about. Why is that? You could say because Bundy supposedly was an upstanding citizen. He was a college graduate. He was studying to be a lawyer. So he's going to law school. And Paul Knowles was a criminal thief in and out of jail his whole life. But Charles Manson was in and out of jail his whole life too. Yet he was, he's very well known. and People talk about him all the time. So comparing to Bundy, maybe the reason Bundy was so much more famous is because Bundy's crime was over a longer period of time. So I'm just ch ch trying to give you some of my ideas on why he's, the, J Paul Knowles is so much more obscure than like Bundy or Manson, two serial killers of his generation. And you got so many other ones. You have Charles Manson, you have Ted Bundy, you have the Hillside Strangler, and many more. This was a big generation for serial killers. I'm trying to think of maybe reasons why. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. But, so another reason I'm thinking is maybe because Bundy's crime was over a longer period of time, so it gave the media a chance to get to know him. You know, he had four years where they were searching for this serial killer and they slowly got to know him and fear him and he was all over the media because of that. But with Paul, it was only four months. So with Paul, there was a lack of opportunity for media coverage. Because four months, I mean, compared to four years of media coverage, you just that lack of opportunity for people to get to know, the, to get to know you and n basically have your face all over the media for people to be talking about you and four months isn't that long and plus another reason is with Paul authorities never knew the murders were connected because there didn't seem to be a similar MO the MO was totally different from murder to murder there was no similarities so the authorities didn't know for sure that all these murders were connected the killings were all so different from the weapon to the victim to the motive some were robbed some weren't nothing was consistent so since the authorities weren't convinced this, all these murders were committed by one person, therefore the media wasn't reporting these killings as done by one person. So the public wasn't scared of like the serial killer on the loose because they didn't even know he existed. They didn't even know these were all connected and that there was a serial killer. To them and to the authorities, it was just these random crimes. And another reason he didn't get the chance to be in media as much as some of the other ones is he got shot before he even went to trial. So he never got to go to trial. So there wasn't much of a chance for his face to be plastered all over the media like Ted Bundy or Charles Manson. So tell me in the comments if you have ever heard of the Casanova killer and why do you think he wasn't as well known as some of the other ones of his generation? It's obviously not for a lack of brutality or the body count because he had just as much if not more than some of these serial killers as far as body count and the brutality was so much whew, was worse than some of these ones in my opinion so yeah let me know in the comments number one who do you think is uh more handsome ted bundy or paul knowles and number two why do you think he he wasn't as well talked about and as well known as some of the other ones and Number three, if you have heard of them. So just let me know in the comments. And also leave in the comments if you have any recommendations of who you want me to cover in this famous serial killer series. <laughs> I have some ideas and some plans on some of the ones I want to cover, but if you guys have any recommendations on somebody you want me to cover, let me know. Because there's a lot of them, so I'm definitely open to recommendations or requests, I should say. Hopefully you guys liked it. And let me know if you think this is a good idea, if you guys are interested in this, me covering some of the famous serial killers. Okay, guys, that's the end of this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and learned something new. Um, oh, yeah, look for the part two, like I said, because I'm going to do a part two to the Casanova killer, reading some of his letters and playing some of the recordings from him talking to a psychiatrist. Unfortunately, I wish we still had the recordings of him, his personal recordings of the details of all of his victims, all of his murders. He kept a log of all of his victims and all his murders, and I guess he explained it in detail. 
on these recordings and then when he handed it over to the lawyer and they gave it to the courts and now they're all lost which that would have been something to hear that that really would have but there are some tapes that he talks to the psychiatrist they're a little bit hard to hear you have to put on your headphones and really turn it up and hopefully you guys will be able to understand what what is being said so yeah that'll be part two and then i'll move on to a another serial killer so thanks for watching and y'all guys all have a good night bye